You're watching Inside Automotive with Jim Fitzpatrick. Hey everyone, Jim Fitzpatrick. Thanks so much for joining us on another edition of Inside Automotive right here on the CBT Automotive Network. We're so happy to have with us an old friend of ours, Mr. Jim Appleton. You've seen him here before on CBT News. He's the president of NJ Car, which stands for New Jersey Coalition of Automotive Retailers. Jim, thanks so much for taking the time out of your very busy schedule there in New Jersey to join us on the show. Well, thanks for having me, Jim. Always a pleasure. Sure. So uh, lots going on out there. Uh, before we jump into what the uh, impact of this crazy election period might have on the industry, which I want to get your take on that. How are things going with, uh, with the state and with the association? Uh, well, things are pretty much uh, status quo. Last time we talked, uh, I, you know, I told you that my biggest concerns uh, were um, you know, how dealers are going to manage and stay relevant in this EV transition that's that's going on. Yeah. And so, you know, concerns about affordability uh, becoming yep. a real challenge in the showroom uh, for uh, new car buyers. No uh, question. You know, these are, you know, still the the two major issues we we are uh, we are trying to wrestle with here sure. uh, in the state of New Jersey. So let's drill down on that a little bit. We were talking before we got recording here today. Talked a little bit about uh, some of the OEMs and what, you know some of the demands that they made on dealers. More specifically, on the on the Ford side, you know they came out a couple of years ago and said, "Hey, it shall be this way, or you will not be selling EVs." Which got you know not just Ford dealers, but the entire industry, I think, upset. But specifically, Ford dealers had to make some huge investments and. And now it looks like they're recoiling all of that, saying, oops, maybe we did too much too fast and uh, required our dealer body to jump in with big investments. And uh, where does that stand? What kind of feedback are you getting from dealers? And what's, what's the yeah. future of that? Look, I mean, before we start trashing the OEMs, let's trash government. Um, <laughs> That's always fun. Quickly, Who doesn't like but, to do uh, that? Yeah, no, but but seriously, you yeah. know, the, 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 this whole EV transition is being driven by government mandates, both in Washington and in in Sacramento, yeah. um, as, as you're aware, there are kind of two sets of EV uh, requirements out there. One is uh, we operate in uh, New Jersey under the California Air Resources Board rules, right. uh, and they have set very specific, very high mandates for EV adoption That's in right. the state. Um, and then you have the rest of the country, uh, which operates under the, the new uh, Biden administration uh, EV um, uh, and clean air proposals, which, while they provide more flexibility in how the OEMs will reach their uh, clean car goals, um, they are still very difficult for the OEMs to manage. And, and of course, you know, so when, when it's difficult for the OEMs, the, the burden gets shifted to the dealer, you know, training, facilities, yep. uh, upgrades, equipment, um, and, uh, and the necessity to, to stock vehicles, which consumers don't necessarily want to buy. Right. Uh, you know, so what we're looking at in this EV transition is OEMs gearing up to build more and send more EVs to the to the dealers in in affected states, and dealers having to, um, uh, to, to 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 take those vehicles into inventory, regardless of whether or not they have customers for them. That's right. Uh, so you know that's a, that's a huge challenge for the dealers. You know, so yeah. we we want to support the OEMs in meeting the uh, uh, the the government mandates. Uh, but by the same token, the OEMs have to maintain some sort of uh, rational and reasonable um, relationship and approach to their dealers on this. Dealers can't be expected to take, um, you know, four out of ten vehicles uh, as electric vehicles in states where those mandates exist. Right. Right. Yeah, it's a very uh, good point. And, and now, go ahead. Well, and 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 pivoting to to the OEMs, you know, you, you know, we have the the recent example of Ford Motor Company. You know, in mm -hmm. addition to to training, in addition to uh, financing inventory, in addition to buying new tools and equipment to uh, to to service and sell mm -hmm. EVs, uh, dealers were asked by Ford and are being and by other OEMs to make massive investments in facilities and equipment to facilitate the EV uh, transition. And now all of a sudden Ford's changed their mind. 
Uh, they've decided that consumers don't want EVs in the numbers that uh, government has mandated, that right. uh, they're not going to build as many EVs. And all that investment that they asked dealers to make and yeah. all those facilities and image uh, and training programs, uh, they've uh, kind of turned away at this point in time. And, and it, it just reminds us that, you know, over the last several decades, manufacturers have tried more and more to get control of facilities That's and right. marketing programs. Right. And dealers have to be very cautious uh, because the manufacturers, mm -hmm. they seem to change their marketing plans and their direction like the rest of us change our socks. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And dealers were asked to invest a million dollars or more yeah. uh, to prepare for this. And now Ford has simply stepped back and said, oh, you know what, never mind. That's not really that <laughs> Oops. important. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I hear you. I've spoken to so many dealers across the country that have made that big investment and echo your feelings. And, and uh, it's just, it's not right. And, and it really hurts the credibility that OEMs have moving forward when they come out with programs like this. And look, this isn't the first time to your point that OEMs have done this. Um, it's been many, many years that they've been doing this. You often ask yourself, does anybody at the OEM level, do they even understand retail automotive? Has anybody ever worked inside of a dealership? Has anybody sold a vehicle? You know, usually the answer is no, but, um, but, but and that's where it comes out. You know, it's kind of like, you know, the, you guys don't understand what we're going through here, you know, and, and, uh, and certainly in the last few years, dealers have you know, 2X, 3X, you know, their net profit. And it's almost like the OEMs go, oh, not only do we want some of that, but we want you now to invest some of that, those, those monies back into your facilities to make us look better. And uh, it's, it's crazy. I mean, for so long, you know, you were making 2.5 cents or thereabouts on, on a, a well-run dealership and on every dollar that came in. And, uh, and that was tough enough, you know, and, and now, you know, they're, they're asking more and more. And to your point, the EV market just isn't there at the level that they expected. Um, and again, you know, this isn't this isn't new. When you know, for as long as I've been an advocate for dealers, we've pushed back at the state legislatures and in our negotiations with automakers on what we consider to be unreasonable facilities mandates. And you know, the automakers will try to turn that on its head and say, oh, you know, the dealers don't want to provide the necessary. Uh, experience for the customer that we think the customer is entitled to. Right. You know, and that's not the case. I mean, any reasonable expenditure, any reasonable investment in facilities uh, that dealers believe is going to help them be more effective in their market is something they're happy to do. It's something they do all the time. The problem is you get these people sitting in a cubicle at the OEM who have never sold a car right. and don't understand what, it, what the consumer that's really right. wants, needs. And, and again, the Ford... Model E program is just the perfect example of this. Yeah. Is group think, you know, people who haven't really, don't really understand the customer, haven't consulted their dealers. Uh, they come down from on high with these uh, facilities plans, but they haven't even consulted their dealers who are the real experts in what consumers want Absolutely. and how to put consumers uh, behind the wheel. That's right, that's right. And then to really threaten them and uh, say, hey, it's, it's either gonna be this way or you're not gonna be selling EVs. And of course, you take that out of the equation for a dealer today thinking about, well, if I can't sell any EVs, what's the future gonna hold? I mean, so therefore it's, 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 it's this, you know, put a gun against the head approach that, you know, dealers are saying, okay, I've, you know, I've had enough on this. I will say there is one, uh, more than one, but one that sticks out to me and that's the uh, Toyota uh, the, you know, the, the Toyota group where they've come out and said, hey, hey, let's kind of pump the brakes on this EV thing. Let's see where this is going. Let's interview and, and do more surveys of consumers and see if the market is there. And everyone now looks at them as the, as the shining star to say, wow, these guys got it right at Toyota. Would you, would you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, um, you know, the, you know, the, the, we can pivot back to, to bashing government now, right? I mean, yeah. you know, government, Government has laid out these mandates. You've yeah. got the California Air Resources Board, which uh, sets the rules for states that command better than 35, almost 40 percent of the marketplace in the U.S. Yeah. Uh, and you've got the EU, which is also setting high um, um, you know, EV yeah. adoption uh, standards. So you, know, you can't blame the OEMs. I mean, they've got to do what government mandates. Yeah. Uh, the problem is that once 
they are forced to make that investment in EVs. Um, and now we see all of the OEMs sort of throttling back because consumer adoption is not there. EVs right. are more expensive. Uh, consumers are not convinced that they're a, uh, a, a rational alternative for them to internal combustion engine vehicles. Yeah. And I think Toyota has it absolutely right. You know, change is incremental. Um, yeah. Human beings don't like change. That's um, right. <laughs> and the government mandates to go all the way from internal combustion engine to zero emission electric vehicles That's almost right actually overnight yeah. is, is doomed to failure. And, and Toyota understood this, and Toyota had a long-term generational plan to start with hybrids and to move to plug-in hybrids, and then eventually to zero emission vehicles, whether it be battery electrics or fuel cells. Um, you know, that, that chapter hasn't been written yet. Yeah. But I think Toyota is really, um, you know, they're way out on a limb uh, here, um, you know, incurring a lot of incoming from the environmental community and from from government regulators but i think toyota has a right uh, consumers are telling our dealers they're mm -hmm. showing up at the showroom interested in more environmentally friendly vehicles mm -hmm. they want to buy an ev but when they figure out the, the the price differential and when they look at the charging infrastructure which just isn't there yet in most parts of the of the world right um they're driving away in a uh, plug-in hybrid yeah, uh, which is, I think sort of the the you know the the, the you got to meet the market and you got to meet consumers yeah. where they you and can't push them too hard. That's right, and that seems to be the bridge, the plug-in hybrid that people say. Well, let me stick my toe in the water here, see how this goes. It kind of takes away my the range anxiety and and uh, checks a few boxes here, and maybe the next go around after this will be a complete EV. Maybe it won't be, but but at least um, it gives those consumers that opportunity to try it on and see if they if they like what they feel, right? And see. Yeah, and and you know this this whole conversation around EVs um, really just is is throwing fuel on the fire for the underlying major challenge that the industry has right now, which is affordability. Affordability. Uh -huh. Yeah, this just you adds know, to it. You know, vehicles are just getting really expensive yeah. uh, and potentially out of reach uh, for working and middle class families in the U.S. I know, right. you know, you know I'm, I'm old, Jim. I know growing up, my family never had a new car. Yeah. Um, it wasn't until all the kids were out of the house that my parents could even dream of buying a new sure. car. But, you know, for the last 30 years, uh, a, a new car every several years has been kind of a a regular thing for yep. most middle class families. That's right. Uh, and I think that, you know, we're, we're looking at average transaction prices of north of 45,000, yeah. almost $50,000. And for EVs, it's even more expensive. That's right. Well, on average, about another 10,000. Yeah, exactly. It's so, crazy. And, and what happens in when, when government starts mandating a certain mix of vehicle products in the marketplace, supply and demand dynamics kick in. Um, and in the state of New Jersey next year, dealers will be required to accept into inventory 43% of all the vehicles that they accept into inventory from their manufacturers will have to be battery electric vehicles. This year, we didn't reach 11% oh EV God. sales. And that's if you include Tesla. Wow. Uh, so I don't know how we go from 10% <laughs> to 43% so, uh, without having major marketplace disruption. So perfect segue to, uh, because we've mentioned a number of times, I know you're passionate about the government and then really them driving this. Let's talk about that because here we are in the middle of an election year. Um, just yesterday, it was announced that Elon Musk, of all people, would support Donald Trump in the upcoming election. I mean, you've got, you know, somebody that's saying, well, we're going to, you know, take take the, the, the gloves off here and and back off of this EV situation. <laughs> you've got the largest seller of EVs out there going, yeah, I support this guy. So, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about that on the way into the studio today going, wait a minute, what just happened? There's got to be a larger play here. And I think everybody's chiming in on what that will be. But could a Trump administration be the answer to what you were just describing, where he comes in and says, hey, you know, this whole mandate thing is crazy. We're throwing it out the window or we're revising it or whatever the case might be, um, because he's, he's never really been a huge fan 
of the EV, um, you know, concept, and and uh, and he's made it himself clear on that. Yeah, look, I'm, I've long since given up uh, trying to understand what Elon Musk is doing or what he's thinking. <laughs> right. Um, but he's going to make but, a huge. I think it's like forty-five million dollars a month or something. Uh, yeah. Between now and the election, to support Trump in his efforts to become president, I don't need it. I don't know that they need that much right now <laughs> per month with the way things are going. But uh, but nevertheless, regardless of which side of the aisle you're on, you know it looks as we speak right now uh, as though it's going to there's going to be another Trump administration. And and how do you feel about that? You know, with regard to EVs. Well, look, with regards to EVs, I won't comment on how I feel about it otherwise. <laughs> but with regards to EVs, right. Uh, the, um, the, uh, 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 the, 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 there's two ways that the Trump administration can affect the trajectory of the uh, EV mandates. First and foremost, um, California Air Resources Board is operating, uh, operating under a waiver from the EPA uh, pursuant to the Federal Clean Air Act. Right. Uh, previously, the Trump uh, the previous Trump administration sought to withdraw uh, the waiver, mm -hmm. uh, which would have required CARB, the California Air Resources Board, uh, to uh, to fall under the federal rule. Right. The second way that the Trump administration can affect uh, this is for all the non-CARB states, the 35 states across the country that are operating under the EPA rule. Uh, you know, the Biden administration just adopted a new and very stringent uh, EV uh, set of EV rules, uh, clean car rules that will require, according to some reports, 65 percent EV sales by 2032. Um, and again, that's not quite as aggressive as the car yeah. rule, but it's pretty aggressive. Yeah, now, the is. benefit of the EPA rule over the car rule is that it doesn't set specific marketplace mandates. It yeah. sets tailpipe and uh, corporate average fuel economy and and corporate average right. pollution standards. So I think that, um, again, the Trump administration could certainly uh, seek to withdraw uh, the waiver uh, mm -hmm. for California, which would free up all the carb states from, from that heavy uh, burden. Mm -hmm. uh, then it would revert to the EPA rule. The, our states would all revert to the EPA rule. Uh, and again, the second uh, bite at the apple that the uh, that the Trump administration, a future Trump administration, might have, is to uh, to to uh, lessen those mandates uh, and to give the industry a little bit more breathing room uh, moving forward. Right, right. And and if you're in the auto industry, especially if you're on the OEM side or the dealers, I guess the dealer side or the OEM side, you know, you might look at a Trump administration to say, okay, with all of those other all of those other things that that may bother you if this is the one thing that he can bring to the table to straighten this situation out, because it is, it's creating a lot of anxiety among retailers and manufacturers, right? Yeah, yeah, for yeah. sure. And but then again, you know, the industry doesn't move on a dime, right? It doesn't pivot on a dime. I mean, right. you know, tens of millions, perhaps hundreds of billions of dollars at this point have been invested in Design and uh, and uh, manufacturing capability to to pivot to a battery electric future, and you know the U.S. is is you know, maybe the, the the one of the biggest, not the necessarily the biggest EV market, but you know you've still got China and you've still got yeah, the EU. That's right. Um, and all these automakers are global businesses; they have to yeah. uh, operate in uh, in you know across the globe. So. Um, you know what that really means uh, in terms of the future. Um, I'm not sure. I, I hope it means more breathing room for OEMs and for dealers uh, to give us time to get consumers more comfortable with this transition. That's right. That's right. There, there's no question. Um, before I let you go, uh, any big initiatives on your to-do list for the second half of the year? Uh, yeah, for sure. Um, you know, we're working on uh, legislation right now, uh, recently introduced in New Jersey, that would address uh, the recall issue mm. uh, and provide uh, dealers with more uh, fair compensation for uh, repairs on warranty and uh, recall work. Mm -hmm. uh, as you might be aware, Jim, you know, less than half of all vehicles under recall are ever repaired, and this poses a real yeah. uh, consumer 
problem when mm. consumers go to trade uh, uh, those vehicles. Yeah. Uh, it also creates a highway safety issue That's uh, right. for people who are driving, uh, motorists who are driving cars that are uh, arguably uh, unsafe uh, yeah. and need attention. You know, obviously to the automakers, a recall is an expense. And right. so I think it's fair to say they don't try as hard as they might uh, to make sure all of those vehicles sure. get repaired. And in New Jersey, we're fixing to uh, come up with a, a plan that forces them to be more intentional about mm. uh, notifying consumers of their uh, of their uh, uh, recalls, and then to compensate the dealers uh, for handling uh, and fixing their manufacturing defects. Uh, you may be aware of the battles that have gone on in Illinois yeah. and Wisconsin and, and, and New York now, uh, attempting uh, to, to get uh, dealers or fairly compensated yeah. for the work that they do. Yep. Um, you know, we're, we have legislation introduced by the leadership bipartisan leadership in both houses of the legislature here in New Jersey that we expect will be moving in the fall. That's great. That's great. And they need, you know, those, those, those laws will need some teeth in them because it's been something that's been abused and there's been nothing that's happened to the OEMs in this case. And uh, it, it, it really, it definitely has to change. There's, there's no question about it. You know what they should do is they should give those notices for recalls to the finance, the captive finance companies. Because if you're ever late on your car payment, man, they call you in a second. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe they could give that to the same people to say, let's call all of our customers. Yeah. Well, I think I think what happens, and look, I'm guilty of it, you may be as well. You know, I get a recall notice, I look at it, you know, if they want to reflash my, yeah. uh, yeah. my computer system or they want to do something, you know, and with the radio, like, I, I don't worry about it. I, um, I know, I know. There are serious recalls out there that there are. That, that are not being addressed. And uh, and I think it's, it's fair to say that um, the OEMs can do a better job. And by the way, you know, some of the OEMs um, would agree with that. Uh, yeah. Particularly when it comes to the real safety issues, like the Takata airbag is, That's a, right. is a good example. Um, yeah, so I think we'll have some some automakers. Hopefully, will come to the table and want to work with us, uh, and agree that there are better ways to uh, to, uh, to to bring these issues uh, to the consumers' uh, forefront. Obviously, the automakers are going to oppose us bitterly uh, on anything that uh, causes them to have to pay more uh, to uh, to fix those cars. But of course. You know, they can resolve that problem and they can avoid that problem by simply building better Fixing cars. Fixing a better, building a better car, right? <laughs> That's exactly right. Yeah, no question. And, and what's happening now is is the the cost of those repairs and the expense associated with repairing uh, those vehicles is being shifted to the, sh the dealer's shoulders. Yeah, that's uh, crazy. The, yeah. The technicians uh, who the unions uh, here in New Jersey are working closely with us on this legislation. Yeah. And ultimately, you know, if a, if a dealer's, you know, 50-50 in the, um, in, the, um, uh, in the shop, 50-50 customer pay or, or manufacturer pay, if the manufacturer is helping themselves to hefty discounts on the 50% oh, side. absolutely. They There's have. That, that yeah. cost gets shifted to the customer pay and that makes the dealer less competitive. That's right. Uh, repair market. And there's probably not an OEM executive out there that's ever had to hire and fill a service department full of technicians because we know how easy those people are to get, right? So now <laughs> Well, and it's becoming it's becoming a real issue not just in the union shops, but in but in all shops. The yeah. the technicians tell me that's right. they don't want to do warranty work. That's right. Because they all work on flat rake. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, if the manufacturer's paying two hours, including all diagnostic time, uh, for a job that takes a seasoned technician three, four, or five hours to do, yeah. then they're gonna they're gonna refuse that work in That's the right. shop. That's um, they're right. gonna push that to some, you know, some some yeah, flunky that just shop. started or That's something. Create yeah. more dissatisfaction, more uh, job stress, uh, and less uh, compensation. So That's right. uh, we're you know, we're in lockstep with the unions on this. Uh, they're going to they're gonna help us move this legislation uh, this fall. That's great. That's great. Jim Appleton, president of NJ Carr. Thank you so much for joining us on the show. It's always great catching up. I know a lot of the dealers that watch are not just in New Jersey, but all over the country. They listen to what you have to say, and it's good stuff. So thank you so much. Well, we appreciate you, Jim. Thanks so much for having me. Great. Thanks.
Thanks for watching Inside Automotive with Jim Fitzpatrick.